Hello, good morning, good morning. Let me get this rain off the windscreen. There we are. See, everything's nicely trimmed back now. Oh, we've been, it's hedge trimming month. July is hedge trimming month. Another hedge on your right. A bit more land on your right, needs trimming. Well, it has been trimmed. Diversion, okay. We're gonna forget diversions. I'm gonna let this guy go because he's got a better view to his left than I have to my right. <coughs> and also he was here for me, or she. Sorry, I'll be with you in a second. Right, you're welcome, madam. Here we go. Now, windy bends, okay, right. We have to go around the windy bends today. And pretty much every day, because of the road works. And this is butterfly wing effect. Some bloke is driving a road roller in Ramsgate so I have to turn right instead of left, 20 miles away. And you'll see why as we, they did all this field on the left hand side here, it looks really nice and flat. Oh, they've planted the cabbages by the look of it. Started to. Oh, I went on, a, I did a lovely flight the other day. I flew, I was at 7,000 feet over the channel it was a nice evening and when you're over the channel I don't think the plane's actually moving because it's, it is moving it's doing 100 miles an hour but you can't you don't get that sensation because you're really sort of judging your motion relative to the uh, the countries of England namely Kent and France and so you know in, in at 7,000 feet relative to the those countries at uh, 10 miles away uh, really the there's no apparent sense of motion and so it's very much like you're just like sitting there sort of hanging in the air this is what the diversion's all about they've resurfaced this road and you can see that last night they've obviously repainted the edges as well someone with a dotty printer has uh, decided to oh i see because all the dots are where people live So I don't know what the difference is between a white dot and a dotty dot. I dare say there's some significance. I've got to retake my driving test in six years. So I shall be the world's expert on dots in six years time. But if you do know, put a note in the comments. So I don't think it makes the slightest difference. I don't think it means you can't park there or anything. It's just, uh, you know, using up white paint, isn't it, really? I haven't painted here yet. <clears throat> but that's, yeah, so that, but, but fortunately, give them due, right? They are doing it in the middle of the night. They're doing, they don't start till seven o'clock, closing the road, and then, oh, hello. My favourite vehicles, vehicles that are more than half the width of the roads that they drive down. That take advantage of uh, other road units, having to pull into driveways and T-junctions to let them through. That's what this traffic jam is all about. One coach has come through and another coach up ahead had to wait for it before it can turn left. Oh no, here's another one. What's going on? He's stuck. He's having to reverse up to, to the turn.
Anyway, what was I going to talk to you about today? All right, I'll have to put a note, sort of jump to five minutes if you're, you know, if you're in a rush. But you should listen to these things on 1.4 times, to be honest with you, you know, there's no point waiting until, you know, unless you're doing nothing else and you've got it on in the background. So, um, yesterday um, we had three patients, I think, uh, and they were like, you know, one one was a fit of bridge. One was a review of a, an ulcer, and uh, and then I think oh, there was another there was another review. And and to be quite honest with you, the day was pretty empty. You know, I mean, it was like it's really weird. Like a month ago, we were complaining about how many patients we got in, and then this month, July all of a sudden demands dropped off a cliff and we've got days where we're taking half day off and uh, or just trying to rearrange so that we don't you know the last thing you want is one patient at nine o'clock and another patient at four o'clock so we're having to yeah well, that's right the other one was a checkup and he, he was coming in at four o'clock and so what we did was we shifted him from tuesday to thursday so he's coming in today but um you know what what I want to talk to you today about is what to do on days where you really don't have enough work. Now, I appreciate this. It's not, most people are going to go, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Because you'll either be in an NHS practice where you've got more work than you can cope with and you don't have a minute, you know, because you're, you're constantly churning away, or you're in a private practice, which is probably booked up, I don't know, two or three months ahead. And and the idea that you would have a day where you just don't got any, you know, have got any patience because nobody's booked in, is it's, it's just completely alien to you. So I do appreciate that my surgery may be somewhat atypical. Now, I also appreciate that you're going to, some of you will be sitting there thinking, right, well, okay, why would I take advice from a crap dentist who's got no patience? No, <laughs> when nobody wants to come and see him, you know, what's the, well, first of all, my advice on what to do when you've got no patience is still quite good advice. And secondly, that is not why we have got no patience, right? We have got no patience because for the patients that like prevention, we run a preventive scheme and we run it in a way that works, which prevents disease and means that they don't need to come in. They come in for checkups, but then they never need to come in for treatment. That's the first thing. Second thing is, for anybody who's a new patient or comes in on a pay-as-you-go basis, we deal with their treatment very efficiently, we get it done very quickly, and therefore we don't um, uh, need a lot of appointments or a lot of long appointments, a lot of follow-ups and extra appointments. Maybe. So, the other thing is that the way the surgeries run is also very efficient which means that, uh, for example, we tried to refer a patient to an implantologist recently. And I said to, um, I, uh, I said to the receptionist, can you ring them up and ask them if they, you know, get in touch with this patient. And later I said to her, are you, did you do that? And she said, they, they're not picking up the phone. She said, I was on the phone for about 10 minutes, nobody answered. But that is just unforgivable. And there are no circumstances under which you shouldn't pick up the phone straight away. No circumstances. So, I think that's because we uh, have the system whereby if patients want to make an appointment, they know they've all got a link. And the link's available on the website or if they are a new patient and they want to make an appointment, we say, well, we'll send you a link, pop your details in, you know, it takes you through a few medical, COVID-related medical questions, um, and ask you what your name is, what your date of birth is, um, what your phone number is, not your address, and um, what you want the appointment for. Do you want to register as a new patient? Are you in pain? Uh, are you uh, trying to continue treatment? You know, and also roughly what day and what time you'd like. You know, do you only want to do Monday or Tuesday? Uh, do you only want to do afternoons, etc., etc., etc.? And then, um, obviously, the more options they tick the quicker the appointment they get but the point is that they know that that's how it works 
And so we don't have people ringing our reception all day saying, I'd like to make an appointment. My checkup's due, I'd like to make an appointment. I've, I've made an appointment and I need to change it, blah, blah, blah. It's all done in the background by Google worksheets and uh, what we do is we just get an email saying someone's added an entry to the worksheet, which is over 2,000 lines long now. Um, I don't know what the limit is, obviously 64,000 lines or something. Who can say bit or 16 bit or whatever 64, 65,536 is. Anyway, the old nerd humour there for you. Um, so, oh, I've got me thinking about it now. So, uh, yeah, so really, uh, when I, the only time people ring is when, uh, uh, to let us know that they've arrived and then they're sitting outside in their car and then we tell them to, you know, meet at the door, whatever. So we are very efficient. Now, what do you do that when you're too efficient and you've got no patience? Now, the, the thing is, um, and I think you have to carry the staff along with you on this, is that uh, you have to, the staff, if they're left alone, they'll sit around saying, well, this is boring. You know, this is, uh, this is desperate. We've got to the point now where we can't even book one day ahead, fill up one day worth of patients. Um, and <clears throat> as a self-employed person, you do tend to get a little bit of a, you know, you, do, you have to take a longer term view. I mean, let's face it, I've been doing this for over 40 years now. I know there are uh, highs and lows, you know, there are peaks and troughs in demand. Uh, some months you've got a lot of demand and uh, you, you just can't even understand why. And then other months, nobody wants to come in. But it all balances out, you know, and the stress that you feel when you're overbooked is, is has to be balanced out by the uh, delight that you feel when you get in at nine o'clock and you know that the only thing you've got to do till 10 is make yourself a cup of tea. I mean, that's great. First of all, I would say though, is that you do still have to uh, come in on time. Can you see why I call this the, the junction of death? Another, another foot on the, uh, foot stop to foot forwards. I'd be, I'd be looking for my radiator now. <laughs> so, yeah, so so still keep to the times, all right? Because I don't actually know what time I'm starting today, but I'm still going in for quarter to nine, which is the time I always go in for. I don't know, I have a patient till 11, but I still go in for quarter to nine. It's very demoralizing to the staff, and many of whom get up earlier than you do and drive longer distances than you do to get to work to be to, to to arrive at work and get everything ready and then you to ring in and say oh actually I oh, know I haven't got a patient till 11 so I will I'll see you at quarter to 11 you know and then what are they doing you know they're just like well why couldn't we see you at quarter to 11 as well you know I mean I know someone's got to answer the phone but in these days of mobile phones that can be done from home so so still put the hours in and and the reason is this all right and that is because there are advantages as well as disadvantages to having no patience. Um, and you, you sort of tend to, sometimes it's easier to appreciate what you can do when you've got no patience, when you haven't got no patience. In other words, you're rushed off your feet and you'll think, oh, do you know what, there's this job, I need to do this job. And I, need, and I want to do this job like whether it's pay someone or upstate a spreadsheet or make a change to your website or something. And you think to yourself, I just haven't got the time. This is, this is really stressful, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm booked up with patients all day, so I can't do that job. And then paradoxically, when you've got plenty of time, you're not booked up with patients all day, you can't for the life of you remember what it is that you're supposed to do. You have to sort of sit down and chill out a bit and perhaps sit in front of your computer. And then, and then you can think, ah, oh, this is the time I've been waiting for, the time where I've got nothing to do, apart from clear up my desk or, uh, you know, uh, do a spreadsheet on uh, comparative costs and stuff. Uh, and, and so what you can do is you can then start to do stuff that you don't normally do. 
and then that um, is tremendously satisfying. So don't don't beat yourself up for having some spare time. The dentistry is not all about drilling teeth. A lot of it is about management, inspection, testing, compliance, and even just chilling out in the surgery and not seeing it as a like a Roman galley where you're constantly in the <laughs> up to your Rolex in work. So. Uh, that's that's from the dentist point of view okay now from the um, staff point of view what do you get your staff to do well I think as I say in uh, su- uh, surgery like mine which is a uh, uh, it's not an autocracy it's not a bureaucracy it's a teleocracy which is management through shared purpose where the staff are multi-skilled and anyone can answer the phone anyone can uh, book an appointment um, a lot of a lot of them could be happy to answer the like, simple clinical query, for example. Um, then uh, you have to give the staff a chance to do jobs that they wouldn't normally be able to do. You know, like mark up catalogs or uh, do a bit of research on a uh, better sort of whether you can get a filter roll for the um, uh, dust extractor in the lab and stuff like that. You know, or source uh, cheaper gloves or different gloves or something so don't interrupt them if they are busy I don't mean just walking around with a blank clipboard but if they appear to be busy and they will be you know the receptionist will still have emails to answer and uh, appointments to change and stuff like that then don't interrupt them but then if you've got a big block of time let's say an hour or so where really uh, you know you know that not much is going on the phone's not ringing you know everything's been dealt with then uh, I encourage you to um, either dedicate it to training, such as like uh, revision of CPR training, drug training, uh, collapse in the surgery training, stuff like that. That's very nice sort of thing that you can fit into an hour and make a record that you've carried out that training. So, for example, uh, we had an hour the other day. We went through the emergency care, um, you know, and went through all the drugs, and we just agreed between the three of us that we knew what all the drugs were for and uh, and uh, we did we did some also make it fun you know we did some fun things like we had some out of date uh, ampules of stuff so um, we practiced opening ampules and drawing stuff up into syringes um, and opening an ampule is, is, a, is a scary thing you know I mean I've had ampules crack and turn into shards of glass in my fingers and you're pressing on them quite hard fortunately I think they are designed to fail in a way that they're not going to cut your wrist but you know if you're um, like uh, someone who's not really used to opening ampules you don't really quite understand how precise you have to be in terms of the direction of a crack in the neck because they've only got this tiny tiny little uh, weakness in the glass that, and it has to be addressed straight on to, to pop off if you do it any other way then you are going to it is going to shatter so uh, you know teach them the importance of the dot facing the dot and then we had one particular person who although they had the dot facing them uh, but, but by virtue of the way they were holding it they were sort of they were doing it sideways instead of vertically back so uh, I'll tell you why I've come in the car today. I'll tell you why you have been blessed with one of my sermons today. Because I'm getting a new computer and I need to put it in the car. So, otherwise I would normally come on the bike. And I've got some bike footage, which I might share with you because it is quite exciting, you know, coming on a bike. But um, uh, very difficult, I can't do the narration and don't get the webcam and everything. Or perhaps I'll put this over the bike footage, I don't know. Or perhaps I'll do both, you know, who knows? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so uh, yeah, so by all means, you know, make sure you're up to date on the stuff that you need to rehearse. Um, we did things like taking each other's blood pressure. We, we've got a sphig, uh, and, uh, sphig momenometer and, uh, you know, we spent five minutes practicing how to pronounce sphig momenometer. And then we all tried to take each other's blood pressure and, um, you know, which is interesting in itself, isn't it? Just getting the, knowing how to get the diastolic and the systolic blood pressures out of a spig. Um, 
and what else? Um, yeah, and pulse rates and stuff like that. You know all this stuff, you know all this stuff, but, but it's good fun. Get all your emergency kit out of the cupboard and just practice. And then, then that's time well spent, isn't it? I mean, really, that you could argue that that's time that you should have scheduled anyway if you had did have patients coming in. So really, it does apply. We, we just hope happen that we're more flexible and we can pivot quicker uh, when we find that we've got time which is um, suitable for a particular type of activity, whether it's either clinical or, um, or training. So the other thing that um, we did yesterday, which was quite good fun, is we, um, we've kept a few extracted teeth, um, you know, suitably sterilised and, and washed with antiseptic and everything. And uh, I set them up in some plaster blocks, little square plaster blocks. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, in fact, although I think with hindsight, it'd be better to do it in wax blocks. Now I'm coming to think of it. I think um, uh, you put it in sticky wax or something, you know, like um, what you need is um, uh, you're, you're uh, in the lab, we've got a sanding uh, kit, which consists of a rubber thing like a cotton reel, small cotton reel, and it has like a sanding paper skin on it which you can change and if you take those sanding paper skins and and fill them up with hot uh sticky wax and then put the teeth in i think that would probably be the best way to um uh, present the teeth um, because really you don't really want the staff holding the actual teeth themselves although they, they are quite happy to do that um and then what we did what we did was we got a couple of um large mixing bowls and um gave them some air rotors and got them all kitted up in the um mask and the face mask and everything and the gown and everything and then told them to drill a hole in the top of the tooth and then find at least one canal and root treat it so uh this took about i don't know about an hour start to finish and we got two surgeries and therefore we had two staff doing two air rotors simultaneously and i was i was splitting between the two making sure that they were all you know they weren't drilling their fingers or <laughs> and, uh, stabbing themselves with the rimas or whatever uh, but um i think it's uh, fantastic it gives a much better appreciation of what i was doing uh when i'm root treating teeth and uh, funnily enough the very first patient after this training came in needed a, an instant root treatment lower left five so we i you know and they could see me do what i just shown them how to do and we did this with uh some old uh, reamers and some new reamers and uh, all the drills that I normally use and, um, and believe it or not I mean they are they love this they're like they're looking around the inside of the tooth and saying is that a nerve is that a nerve and I'm going no okay you know there, there's three nerves in there and, the, and so if you know two of them you can usually work out where the third one is and the person who had a upper molar uh, didn't root treat the palatal nerve. She root treated the mesial buccal nerve, believe it or not. Because <laughs> that was just like... The reason why you put them in wax blocks, by the way, is so that they can't see if the rima pokes out the end of the roots. Um, although, although, to be honest with you, I said to them that I wasn't that concerned. Because whether they were short or long, the whole point was to introduce them to the equipment and the materials and get them to get a better understanding of what I'm trying to do with when I'm doing when I'm doing it now stone me these two nurses did two perfect root treatments I mean root treatments I would be proud of and uh, you know right to the tip of the roots and everything absolutely would pass any any dental exam and I'm so pleased with them for doing that because they they really really got the hang of what they were trying to do in terms of enlarging the canal and one of them created a step so I showed her how to negotiate around the step by bending the reamer etc etc and uh, she worked past the step and still uh, reamed, reamed the root out perfectly and filled it we used tube seal we used uh, a thermophil point uh, for each uh, Come on, Mr. Haulage. Okay. 
Uh, and okay, you know, I mean, look, you know, these thermofill points, they don't cost nothing. And uh, Rima packs don't cost nothing. But training is training, do you know what I mean? Uh, what they, the experience they got and the knowledge they got from that experience is, uh, was, is, is more than worth the few quid in materials it cost uh, to do that. So, uh, and that was good. And then today, what I think we'll probably get them to do today is to um, make a plaster cast of their thumb. Now, what we did was, with, with these root fillings, um, we cracked the plaster off, because the plaster is radio-opaque, and then um, just uh, fixed the tooth to the x-ray sensor with a rubber band. And I took an x-ray of the teeth. Um, to determine whether or not you know that they they root filled them fully, and then um, we took the two X-rays and uh, made a screenshot of them and put them on a certificate, and, and I gave them a certificate each, a certificate of achievement, as uh, today or yesterday being the the day they carried out their first root treatment. You know, I mean, okay, it was only one root in a three, but I mean, it was a root and it was treated, so it's a root treatment. So. <laughs> And uh, then uh, I insisted that we take some photographs of me handing over the certificate to them in the classic, you know, like I've just done an implant course photo. Now watch this, watch this. You see this where it says here road, no through, no through road, road ahead closed, diversion, etc., etc. right? Now, this is the shortcut I use to get around the roadworks. And nobody is going to use this now because they, there's a sign up saying the road is closed, isn't there? Can you see a closed road? I can't see a closed road. I can see a lorry, I can see some people with orange jackets on up ahead. That's just a delivery. So here's the closed road, but here is also the diversion that gets you around the roadworks. So in fact, I think everybody stopped using this diversion because they're convinced that the, um, you know, they've closed the diversion down, but in fact they haven't. So I only found this out by scooting, scouting on the scooter, scouting on the, on the, on the Vespa. I mean, I can appreciate these people don't want their road being used as a cut through. But what are you going to do? I'm nice and respectful. I don't, I'm not like the, the Range Rover behind me who wants to come down here at 90 miles an hour. I'm quite happy to do it at a pootling 25 or something. And he can't overtake me, so he's stuck. So that's tough luck. M555 AGF. Yeah, you see, that's why we don't want to run the wildlife over. There's an unwritten rule in the country that you try not to drive more than 40 miles an hour because 40 miles an hour to a bird is the speed at which something like a kestrel would strike. Uh, not that kestrels attack birds really, but the, the predators, bird predators, strike at about 40 miles an hour. And so birds are optimised to escape anything going 40 miles an hour or less. They're not capable of coping with anything going 40 miles an hour or more. So um, you're more likely to hit a bird or run over a bird if you're going 45 or 50. So anyway, there's a lot of, you know, oh, I don't like having my photograph taken and stuff like that. But um, in practice, you know, they, 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 we printed them out certificates. One of them stuck it up in her locker. The other one's taking it home, probably to show her daughter, which is good. The um, plaster thumb idea is just another, is a variation on what we did as dental students, where we took plaster cards of each other, cards of each other's faces, uh, by um, by taking alginates of the faces and then casting it up with plaster. And uh, you really, all you need to do is mix up alginate, stick it in a uh, cup, stick your thumb in, wait a minute, 
and then pour plaster in it and you get obviously you get a very remarkably lifelike model of your thumb but again the point is it's teaching people about I'm not going to tell them about the cup I'm going to get them to decide how to how best to do it and uh, they might even come up with a better idea uh, and also although they are quite happy uh, dealing with alginate from the mixing point of view they've never really uh, used it as an end user so again that'll be interesting to give them some insight into how a person who is trying to achieve something with alginate might think about alginate as opposed to someone who's just trying to make sure that it arrives um, you know before it sets and and in the, the right sort of consistency with no lumps so a subtle change in uh, Move there, you know, in, in approach. Uh, plus, they get a plaster thumb, <laughs> which is, you know, it's got to be fun, isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, take it. So what's that? It's my thumb. Uh, perhaps if they they get on well with their thumbs, they move on to bigger and better things. Who knows? Right, reversed in, ready to receive new computer box. Lovely, anyway, nice to talk to you and don't worry if you're so efficient that you have the odd day with no patience. And don't, because financially it doesn't make it, we're still financially viable, just as viable as when we did. So <laughs> it's not really a, you know, I mean I did a root treatment yesterday, 300 quid, this emergency root treatment, 350 quid, I got for and I could only make that money because I didn't have anybody booked in and I was able to do it on the spot and that's fantastic value for the patient 350 quid for a root treatment that was done like within 10 minutes of her walking in I mean think of the value you're creating there I know you know are you not going to get a lot of new high value customers with that sort of service you know it's gonna <clears throat> most dentists would couldn't dream of providing that sort of service so anyway, <clears throat> I'll um, I'll um, that's about it for today, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.